Thank you. 
Persecution or whatever we go through here on earth is nothing compared to what you went through on the cross. Lord, and it's just to make us over in the image of your son. Help us to be thankful, Lord, even for the things we don't like or don't understand. Just knowing, Lord, that you're there and you're the engineer and you're getting all that dross out and making us pure silver so you can see your reflection, the reflection of your son. Lord, help us stick together as a family and help us to keep staying in your word and not only that, doing it, Lord. Thank you, Father. Amen. And now you may greet each other with a holy kiss. <laughs>So if you need a Bible this morning, we're going to be in Acts uh, chapter 19, uh, finishing up that chapter. If you need a Bible, if you'll raise your hand, Michael will put one where it counts, right in your hand. Okay, in the way of announcements, uh, as always, we need more teachers and helpers in, in our children's church because we have so many children in there and it's getting bigger and bigger, so we always need more. Uh, as far as the e-bulletin, if you don't receive our e-bulletin that has all the announcements and all the things that are coming up, 
and you'd like to get that, if you'll get a sheet of paper out there by the Agape box and put your name and your email address, then we'll be sure to add you to the list. Uh, that way you can keep up with what's going on. A few announcements I'd like to highlight is coming up in, on September the 29th, there's going to be a taco night at the home of the Glazes at 6.30 p.m. for anyone who is, wants to be involved in our young adult, our college age, and under 30 group. Uh, we're going to have a meet and a taco fellowship night at 6.30. There's a sign-up sheet on the table right by the stairwell. So if you're interested in being there, if you'll write your name on that for one, if you have any questions, if you'll see Donna or Aaron, they'll fill in all the blanks that I left. Uh, also, ladies Bible studies are beginning this week, Tuesday, September 29th. Uh, as last week, uh, Pastor Aaron led the men's group in the evening. He does that every other Tuesday. The ladies uh, will also be doing that every other Tuesday. Tuesday. Uh, that begins September the 19th. There'll be a ladies group uh, that meets in the morning and one in the evening. There's a poster out on the bulletin board if you'll check that out if you'd like to be a part of either one of those. Uh, also, as I mentioned, Men of the Word in the evening happens every other Tuesday, the second and fourth Tuesday of each month with Pastor Aaron at 7 p.m. in the cafe. And then every Tuesday morning at 6.30 a.m. at Chick-fil-A on Watson Boulevard is Men of the Word uh, with Greg Cannington. There's always the Word of, on Wednesday with Pastor Phil at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesdays in the cafe. It's a growing group, so if you want to come out, out and see what the excitement's all about, and then Misfits every Friday, 6 p.m. in the cafe. Now, if you're here, and you've been here a while, and you're interested in either hosting or leading a care group, if you'll see me uh, after the service, we want to do a class that's for people who are interested in being a part of that. And the care group ministry is very important, in most Calvary Chapel is small groups, some people think of that, but it trains up leaders, people who can lead up, trains up people to be accountable one to another, to pray for each other, it's an intimate group where people get to meet and know and pray for one another. And lastly, the Harvest Festival. On October 21st, from 1 to 4, we're going to have our annual Harvest Festival for children. Uh, and if you have any questions about that, if you'll see Marsha, we're trying to round up all the details for that. And because of that, if you want to bring candy to donate for that, the prayer room, the church office, the new church office, maybe you didn't notice, but now the middle room is going to be the church office. We'll have a place in there for you to bring candy and deposit it so that by the time we get to the end of October, the 21st, we'll be ready. All right, so if you remember from last week's study, there was kind of this crescendo of Paul's ministry, his work there in Ephesus. And it started with Paul. He found this group of 12 men who did, we couldn't really tell if they were saved or not, but he led them either to the assurance of their salvation or into their salvation. However you want to view that scene, as you read that passage, Paul was instrumental in asking questions to determine where these guys were in their relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul also, he began teaching daily in this school of Tyrannus, because remember, he went to the Jews and he taught for three months. And after three months, the unbelieving Jews, they got tired of him, but at least they lasted three months, right? And Paul, he took all of the believers and he found this place, the school of Tyrannus, where they could meet in the middle of the day, the heat of the day, and teach for about three hours a day, every day. You see, Paul was trying to teach these Jews that from the Old Testament scriptures, that Jesus was in fact their Messiah. And so when the unbelieving Jews, they didn't believe that he was. In fact, they would call that blasphemy. So he taught in the school of Tyrannus for two years. And the scriptures told us all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So his ministry there was growing. And then there were unusual miracles that we read about. You know, these are beyond just regular old everyday miracles. These were unusual. There was something different about them that God performed through the Apostle Paul, where many were healed and demons were cast out as they took Paul's sweatbands and his aprons. 
And these were things that he used when he was making tents. He'd sweat. And he had sweatbands and the aprons. And they would take them. And they'd think just because they touched Paul and had his sweat on them, if they would place them on their loved one, they would be healed. As a result of that, fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified again. Lastly, conviction fell on all the believers. And they confessed and repented of holding on to these occultic magic books and practices from their past. And then they took action based on their repentance, what God had convicted them of. And they took all of these books voluntarily. They brought their books together and they burned them all as an offering to the Lord. So the Lord, the word of the Lord grew mightily and it says it prevailed. That is, it was victorious above all. So as we have seen previously in the book of Acts, and as we have witnessed, most every one of us who is a believer could attest to this, and we've noticed that even this morning, that every time God's doing a work, every time we step out and we choose to follow God with everything that we have, evil opposition shows up, doesn't it? The evil one wants to tear down what God is doing in your life and in my life. He wants to bring this one-two punch of doubt and fear. And we'll see that today in our study. And it is so, so true. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to Acts chapter 19, if you'll stand with me, we're going to read the whole passage. It's only 20 verses. Only 20 verses. Made it sound short, didn't it? <laughs> Verse 21 is where we'll begin. It said, When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the Spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia, for a time. And about that time there arose a great commotion about the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, he made silver shrines of Diana, or little figures, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. And he called them together with the workers of similar op- occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity in this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling falling in disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificent destroyed whom all Asia and the world worship. Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath, and they cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the the theater, and with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's travel companions, and when, they, and when Paul wanted to go to the people, the disciples would not allow him. Then some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, Paul's friends, sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Therefore, some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the whole assembly was confused, and most of them did not know why they had come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they found out he was a Jew, all with one voice, one voice they cried out for about two hours, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians as temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Zeus. Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought these men here 
who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. For we are in danger of being called in question for today's uproar. There being no reason which we may give account for this disorderly gathering. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you for today. And Lord, I, I pray that this morning, God, that you'd help each of us to see that as we step out, we know that there's going to be a spiritual attack. But we know there's going to be a distraction, confusion, frustration. And Lord, we know that by your Spirit, you can strengthen us and encourage us. So that's what we ask today, that for each heart here that may be in a battle, whether a physical battle or a spiritual battle, Lord, we just pray that your Spirit will be upon them and in them, Lord, to encourage their heart, to strengthen them in their, in their fight. Lord, we just pray that you'd help us to make that faithful step that you've called us to do as your believers, the ones who love you. And as we love you, help us to step out in our faith, knowing that we're going to face opposition, but knowing also that you are the victor, Lord. You are the one who has won the victory for us before the battle ever begins. And we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So verse 21 says, when these things were accomplished, that's all the things we announced that were the crescendo of Paul's ministry, all the great things that were going on in the ministry there in Ephesus, Paul proposed in the spirit when he passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. But before he goes, before he makes that, that statement kind of tells us what the rest of the book of Acts is going to be like, because it's going to follow that pattern pretty much. Verse 22 says, So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus. But he himself stayed in Asia for a time. So after all the great things that are going on, Paul knew that in this spirit, he was supposed to continue on to Macedonia. Why? Because he was going to receive an offering to take back to Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem who was struggling. Remember, the Jews in Jerusalem, they pretty much controlled everything. So if someone was a believer and they found out, well, that's probably going to lose their job, lose their way of life oftentimes. So anybody that stayed behind in Jerusalem would be having a difficult time. They were going to take up an offering and take to the church. And it's a great picture to me, a great picture of unity. Because these are Gentile believers who are going to give this offering to take back to the Jewish believers. Remember at the very beginning there was kind of a, a they weren't really together. You know, but now we see this unity. God had torn down the walls of separation that existed between the Gentile believers and the Jewish believers, and now they are the body of Christ. And then Paul, he gives us, again, that itinerary for the rest of the book of Acts, where he's going to go. He's going to keep going to Macedonia. Well, let's see if I'm doing this for you. He's going to go from Macedonia. He's going to go on to Asia. And Achaia, I mean, not Asia. He's in Asia. And then on back to Jerusalem for a return trip to finish up this third missionary journey. And then once he gets to Jerusalem, he gets to go to Rome. Although it's not quite the way he planned it, I'm sure. Verse 22, Paul does something very unusual for him, and he sends Timothy and Erastus on ahead. Because remember, Paul, he likes to travel with his travel companions. Why? Because it says that Timothy and Erastus, they ministered to Paul. They were encouragement for Paul. You know, they weren't trying to tell Paul what to do. They were there for Paul's needs. Paul, whatever you need us to do, that's what we're going to do. And as they ministered to Paul, they ministered to others. Paul liked having his ministry team together, but he sees this need. And it's thought by many that 
Timothy and Erastus, they go on ahead and they take the first letter that Paul writes to the Corinthians. And that kind of makes sense because if you read 1 Corinthians, what did it start out with? There was a division in the church, right? Because some say they followed Paul, some would say they follow Apollos, and some would say we follow Peter. But Paul writes this letter of encouragement to encourage them to stick together. They are all of the same body. We are all of Christ. And also it says in verse 22, as they mention Erastus, we don't know a lot about Erastus, but in Romans chapter 16 and verse 23, it says, Gaius, host of me and the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, greets you. And Cordus, the brother. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20, Erastus remained in Corinth. But Trophimus I left sick at Miletus. So Bible commentator Christomakers, he makes this comment. In 1930, archaeologists in the city of Corinth discover a slab of pavement which bears this inscription. Erastus, commissioner of public works, sustained the cost of this pavement. Now, it's not known if specifically this is speaking of the same Erastus, but it is found in Corinth where he was the city commissioner. So Paul, he remains in Ephesus a little while longer. And after two years and a few months of teaching in the synagogue, his total time in Ephesus ended up being about three years. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 8 and 9, Paul tells us, I shall remain in Ephesus until Pentecost for a wide door for effective service is open to me. But there are many adversaries. And that's what we're going to look at today, the adversaries. Verse 23, as we continue, it says about that time, just when things were going great, there arose a great commotion about the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines or little idols of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. So verse 22, verse 23, where it talks about the way, and we talked about this a little bit before, the Christians were called the way. Because Jesus said what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But if you were alive back in the 70s, you may remember a popular t-shirt design that had a hand pointing up, and it said, one way. It's kind of the same thing. It's really a great way to think of people who are believers in Jesus Christ. You know, because that term Christian, it kind of has some very loose walls on it, doesn't it? There are a lot of people in our nation who proclaim, hey, I'm a Christian, but when you ask them what they think of the Word of God and what their biblical worldview might be, it doesn't really line up with what Jesus said. So the way is a great way to think of believers. But as they proclaim those of the way, darkness raises up. A great commotion, a riot is brewing. You see this man Demetrius, he had a bone to pick because folks were getting saved. And what happens when people get saved? Put a huge dent in his finances. Because his way of making a living was he made these little silver idols of Diana, which we'll talk about in just a second, but these personal Diana idols were ones that people could take home. And they could put it on their shelf and they could worship these little things. And when Luke, the writer of the, the book of Acts, when he says no small profit, he means they were making huge money. So about Diana, Diana is her Roman name, but Artemis is her Greek name, and she was the daughter of Zeus. And it is said that there was this black meteorite that struck the ground, and that it had a hideous appearance, appearance of this multi-breasted woman. <laughs> whether it was a car after the meteorite hit the ground or whether it fell and it looked like that when it hit the ground, we don't know. But it is thought that she was a goddess 
the Zeus sent down to the earth. She was a goddess of wild animals. She was a goddess of the hunt. She was a protector of young women and of fertility. Legend has it that she fell down from the heavens, and that's where the temple was erected. It was the centerpiece, really, of this temple. This hideous, multi-breasted woman who was wrapped like a mummy below the waist. And she was worshipped in a very sensual and sexual way with temple prostitutes. The temple, though, the temple of Diana in Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the world at the time. Many historians believe it was one of the most beautiful buildings that was ever built at that time. The meteorite was the centerpiece of the temple. And I know you're thinking that's kind of like a Joe Dirt thing, right? (laughs) But this meteorite meant a lot to these people. The temple could handle thousands of people at a time. It had 127 columns that were 60 feet tall. Wow. So these, our ceiling is about 20 feet tall. So these 127 columns that surrounded this building were three times the height of our ceiling, just to give you the idea of her size. The temple structure itself was larger than a football field. That's a pretty big building, isn't it? And around the world, there were also 39 temples for Diana at that time. But this one in Ephesus, that was their home base. That was the main one. So you can see how important this particular goddess was to these people who made these little silver shrines for people to purchase to take home for them. Because people would travel thousands of miles to come to this temple. And they wanted a token, something to take home so they could worship at home. Very big business for people like Demetrius. Now we're told, as the name of the Lord was magnified and the word of the Lord was prevailing in Asia, which is modern day Turkey, there in Ephesus, this worship of Diana began to have a decline. Their business was in a slump. All of Demetrius, all of his sales charts, they were plummeting. All the arrows were pointing downward because they were losing money. This made Demetrius furious because people care about their money, don't they? So he incites this great disturbance as a last-ditch effort to try to rescue their trade. As we pick up back in verse 25, it says, He, Demetrius, called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but also throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods with a little g which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised that her magnificent destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. So Demetrius, doing what he needs to do, he gathered all of his fellow craftsmen, all of the silversmiths guild in the area, And he incites them, he provokes them against Paul, blaming Paul for their business failure. And it's an incredible accusation that he makes. But it's also an incredible praise, right? Because Paul has spread the word throughout all of Asia. And we read that last week. Paul has turned their world upside down with the gospel. And no one wants to really purchase their false idols. Their idols made with hand. So the accusation of Paul teaching against the error of idol worship, that's absolutely true. What he's saying is true. Paul was teaching the correction of the truth of the word of God that idol worship is not to be done and things made with hands are not gods. They're not true gods. The one true God is the one who made everything. Nothing has made our God. The other accusation he makes is that their industry is going to suffer financially. That these personal idols are no longer going to be needed. People aren't going to want them anymore. And that's also true. 
But it was not Paul's intent or purpose to ruin their business. You see, that's not what he was doing. It was the result of him proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ and people accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And that is what made the change of their hearts that they no longer needed these little idols that were made with hand. That's why people were turning away from this idolatry. This happened as a result of Paul preaching Jesus to the people, not because he was preaching against Diana. Does that make sense? So we can read about Paul and what he had to say about idol worship in Romans chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, where he explains that man chose idol worship made with hands over worshiping the one true God who made everything. And then when they did that, God let the people follow their own desires. What happens when man follows his own wisdom and his own desires? It's not good, is it? Things turn at the end of Romans chapter 1, things turn into hideous sin, and it turns into chaos. That's the result of man's logic, man's thinking. When we stray away from the word of God, the truth that God has given us, we may think we know something. And in fact, we may know a little bit. But the truth is, when we stray away from the word of God, that's when chaos breaks out. We also read about what Paul had to say on auto worship in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where Paul instructs the believer to flee auto worship. It does, we're not to have a part of that. It doesn't belong. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we don't need to have anything to do with God with the little g. Now what Demetrius was proclaiming, what he was claiming to his fellow workers, was that Paul was teaching against the idea of having faith in idols made with hands. Absolutely true. Paul was not, however, specifically targeting this particular group that made these little idols of Diana. He wasn't standing outside of this temple with a picket sign. You know, he wasn't boycotting the, t the particular temple. He wasn't standing outside and shouting at all the people who were going in. Paul and his ministry team, all they were doing was telling people about Jesus Christ and how much he loved them, even though they were sinners. That we were all sinners. And that Jesus Christ, he's the one that paid it all on a cross, just like we sang. You know, he paid our debt. But not only that, he was buried and he rose again the third day, giving us the victory that we don't deserve, that we can't earn, that we can't buy, that we can't purchase. There's nothing I can do to put myself in a right relationship with Jesus Christ. All I can do is accept what he has done for me. And then when I accept that, I want to live for him. I want to make that decision to take that step in faith. Paul and his team were simply proclaiming the truth of faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Which brings me to this thought of our generation. You see, we often think we have to speak out against particular things. What is wrong, what we see, what God tells us that we see is wrong in his word. And oftentimes there are boycotts and protests. And that happens. And I'm not saying that these things are necessarily wrong. But what I am saying is we look at Paul's model of ministry, there is a better way. That better way is instead of speaking out about how bad things are and how desperate the times are, is simply proclaiming the truth of God's word. But telling people that Jesus loves them and he wants to know them in a personal way and that Jesus has a better way. He's simply proclaiming the truth of the gospel and the message of the Savior. That's what was changing people's lives here in Ephesus. And that will change people's lives today. We don't always have to be in the negative. We can simply proclaim the truth of the Word of God. The best defense against wickedness is to have a great offense. And that offense is the Word of God. 
Amen? So then after the truth is proclaimed, then we can expose this deception that Satan puts in the world. After we have people's ear that they hear that we are interested in their lives and how much Jesus loves them, we love them the same way. Then we can start approaching and working on things, just like God did with us. You know, when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, you know, that was a great day. But as I grew in Christ, as I studied His Word, as He renewed my mind and changed me, that's when I began to realize, you know, God, Your Word, that's something there. It's right every time I read it, every time I study it, every time I see something that You want to change in me, it is accurate. You see, Demetrius, he was worried about losing money. Mm -hmm. And he's just being honest with his fellow workers. You know, if you want to know what someone really believes in, what they really trust in, if you take their money away, <laughs> they'll be honest. You see, he revealed that he cared more about the money, but then he talked about Diana, you know, worried about Diana and people falling away from that. He's worried about the temple. But his main concern was neither of those things. His main concern was what was in his wallet. Yeah, this, is mm -hmm. this is something we should all be aware of, though. As Paul was ministering to the people there in Ephesus, as the ministry was growing, as people were falling under conviction, and they were confessing, and they were repenting, and they were getting rid of the stuff that didn't belong in their lives, what happened? The opposition that rose up. The opposition is coming. If you and I, if we choose to follow Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, if God puts something on our heart and we take that step of faith, we're going to face opposition. But know this, God has given us his full armor. We're to put that on. Jesus has already won the battle, even if it doesn't seem to us at the time that he has. How many of you have ever been in a battle and you think, God, why did you leave me here all alone? I, I don't mean to quote hee haw, but <laughs> why did you leave me here all alone? You see, because Satan has this one plan. He wants us to give up. He wants us to give in. That is his deception for mankind. When someone trusts in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and we take that step of faith, God, I see what you're doing. I know what you want me to do. I'm going to take this step of faith. And then the attacks come. The attacks have this purpose. He wants us to give up. He wants us to give in. Maybe he wants us to quit going to church altogether. Maybe that's the case. But Satan wants to drive us away from the throne of grace. Because there's power there. You see, when we're seeking God, when we're trusting God, there is power upon our lives. Satan does not remind us. Satan does not want us to be reminded of that. You see, we're more than conquerors. And Jesus Christ our Lord, he's the one who loved us first. And because of that, nothing can prevail against us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Romans chapter 8 tells us all these things. So back to our story in verse 28. The scripture said, Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath, and they cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord. Having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's travel companions. You see the other men, Demetrius got all these other men in the same trade. He got them stirred up, right? He got them angry, and they were mad. They had this fierce indignation against Paul and anyone who proclaimed to be members of the way. They wanted to punch Paul's lights out. And they went through the streets crying out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And I can visualize this gangster mob of people. They're just going through the city with their sticks and, and anything they could grab, really. 
looking for someone to blame and accuse. And they happen up on Gaius and Aristarchus, who are friends of Paul, and they take them into the theater. Now, the theater in Ephesus was a very big place. Some say it would hold as many as 25,000. And acoustically, it was very well suited for people to make speeches in that. The whole city was in an uproar, and they all bustled into this theater. This Gaius, Romans 16.23, tells us it was Paul's host. He was Paul's host while he stayed in Ephesus. We also read in Colossians chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, that Aristarchus, a fellow Jewish believer of Paul, accompanied him to Rome while he was in prison. Isn't it kind of neat to see how all these little bits and pieces fit together with all of the other parts of Scripture? I think it is. They gather all these people, they go into the theater, and they are all angry, and they're all mad, and they're all chanting, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Verse 30 says, And when Paul wanted to go to the people, the disciples would not allow him. Then some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent to him, pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. And most of them did not know why they came together. <laughs> and they drew Alexander out of the multitude. This is somebody different, and the Jews putting him forward. Alexander motioned with his hand. He's getting ready to make his defense to the people. But when they found out, the people of the city found out that he was a Jew, all with one, vo one voice cried out for about two hours. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. You know, Paul, he's like, let me at him. He wants to go into the theater and present the gospel to all these people, even the people that are against him, people that hate him. But the disciples hold him back, and these other officials of Ephesus who were his friends, maybe people that he met in his tent-making business, they pleaded with him not to go because they knew if he went into the theater, what would happen? He would be mugged and beat up and possibly left for dead. The crowd was unpredictable because they didn't even know why they were there. With any good riot, as we see today, the Bible tells us some shouted one thing and some another. The assembly was confused and they didn't know why they had come together. It's hilarious. All these people had no idea. The whole city's in the theater. But most of the people had no idea why they were even there. Isn't that true of protests today? We see them on TV and they ask them, you know, specific pointed questions. Why are you here? And most of the people can only quote a bullet point. Well, I'm here because of this, or I'm here because of that. But they can't give any detail of why they believe that particular thing. And so Alexander, who's a Jewish leader in Ephesus, he's drawn into the fray. And I'm thinking all the other Jewish men kind of did like that. And he was left standing out on the point. I don't know, it's just what I see. He wanted to let all of these people know that the Jews, they weren't associated with what Paul was teaching. He wanted to make sure they weren't going to come after him. He wanted to make a point. But when he gets ready to make his point, he raises his hand. That's how they did. They'd raise their hand to begin to speak. Everyone begins to chant, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Kind of like the USA chants you see at a football game or some event. But they're chanting, Great is Diana of the Ephesians, over and over, for two hours. I'm sure whoever was selling bottled water at that event, <laughs> they were probably making a killing. But it's funny, because they all joined in this chant, but they didn't even know why they were there. Isn't that amazing? David Gusick says for two hours they shout a great Diana of the Ephesians. Think of how this echoes in our own time. And see the strangeness of our world. People say today in words, actions, time, and dollars spent, we wouldn't really shout this out. But the way we live our lives, the things we spend our money on, this is the things we say today. Great is my sports team. 
Great is my political party. Great is the consumer economy. Great is internet porn. Great is material wealth. Great is getting drunk or getting high. And David continues, he says, And yet, if someone says, Great is the Lord Jesus Christ, they are regarded by many as strange or a weirdo or a freak. You see, we may not get into a theater and shout about how great these things are in our lives. But just like Demetrius, we can tell how important things are in our lives by where we spend our time and our money and our efforts. So as we continue in verse 35, it says that when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Zeus, that meteorite? Verse 36, therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls or judges. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. For we are in danger of being called in question for today's uproar. There being no reason which we may give account for this disorderly gathering. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Now this city clerk, he wisely, he let the crowd kind of wear themselves out, right? Everybody wanted to quit chanting anyway. So he calls them and he says, look, settle down. And then he points out, the importance in their city of the worship and the temple of the goddess Diana. And he says it can't be denied. Everybody knows that Diana, her home is right here. It's the headquarters. Everybody knows that. And then he points out that Gaius and Aristarchus, well, they're not temple robbers. And they haven't spoken specifically or directly evil of the mythological goddess Diana. So you see the main, the main concern of this clerk, as would be with any politician, was that they are in danger with the Roman government. Remember, Rome is over all. And if there's a disturbance like this, well, they'll send in forces. And when they do that, they don't really care who they hurt or who they put to death. So he's probably in fear that this is about to happen. So he quiets the crowd and he reminds them of the proper way to handle such matters in the courts with judges and lawyers. And after he settles the crowds, he sends them home. So as we close today, I want us to note that at this time, Diana worship was big business. It was big in people's lives. They thought it meant something important. It was a big deal, especially in Ephesus. But today, I have a picture. That's all that remained of that temple with its 127 columns. Oh, wow. Well, Diana is not so great today, is she? But. What about the name of Jesus? Is that name still around? Yes, it is. He's still going. He's still saving souls. He's still changing lives. He's still healing the hurting and the sick. He's still reaching down to man so that everyone who would call upon the name of the Lord should be saved. Jesus is still around. I can hear these words as I was studying. That's... If you remember back in Acts chapter 5, when the Jews are trying to decide what to do with this group of people, Gamaliel speaks up in verse 38 and 39. He says, And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. 
For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing, just like that slide we saw. And verse 39 says, but if this is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you be found even to fight against God. And God's word continues to this very day. And the word of the Lord grew mightily, and it prevailed. And it's still prevailing today. It's still growing today. Amen? Amen. Amen. And maybe you're here, and you don't know how much Jesus loves you. Maybe all you've heard in your life is what you're doing wrong, or how you're not doing things correctly. But know this. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. That was while we were still a screw-up, like me. Jesus, he died for me. And he wants to know you. He wants to have a personal relationship with you. And that's so simple. He did all the work. All we have to do is say, yes, Jesus, I want you in my life. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I know you died on the cross for my sin, and you rose again the third day, and you gave me the victory not because I deserve it, not because I can buy it, not because I earn it, but because you love me first. So simple. If you're that person today, please talk to me. Talk to Aaron sitting over here. Just come talk to us. Let us pray with you. Let us show you from God's word how much Jesus loves you. You see, because if we step out in faith, what's going to happen? We're going to face that opposition. And maybe that's you today. Maybe you're facing the opposition that you just don't understand. Let us pray with you. Let us encourage you. God does not want you to be a downtrodden and defeated believer in Jesus Christ. He wants you to be that victorious child of God who stands on the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your Word. We thank you for how powerful it is, God, that you can change lives, that you can turn us away from those things that would do us harm, that would cause confusion and destruction, that would cause us to doubt and fear. God, it is your desire that we would stand up for you, and that as we stand up for you, that we would know without a shadow of a doubt you have won the victory before the battle ever starts. Lord, we praise you for that, and we thank you for how you do work. Lord, pour out your Spirit upon your people today. Lord, change our, heart, our hearts and our minds. Renew our spirit, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <coughs>
to the world and keep speaking your name and keep shining, Lord, and just keep speaking your word in the lives of people that are around us to encourage them, to point them to, to Jesus. And I just pray, Lord, we would just have the guts to do it, the courage, Lord. You stand behind us and you go before us, Lord. Help us not to be afraid. And even if we are afraid, Lord, we'll speak your word anyway. And you're the one that's doing the work. We just have to be willing. God, just help us. Help us, Lord, to do that. And anybody who doesn't know you or, or is afraid, I, like Pastor Jerry said, I hope that before they leave today, they'll talk to somebody. And um, they won't leave empty, Lord. Thank you, Father. And go with these dear people, Lord. And bring them back, all of us back together again next week. And I just thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. You're all powerful. Amen. 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 Love y'all. <laughs> 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 <laughs>